The topic we're talking about this morning is the topic of rescues, the topic of being rescued. And God's timing is just unbelievable. Now, if you know me well at all, uh, then you know uh, that I am a huge, huge fan of first responders. Huge fan of first responders. Fire, police, EMT, 911 operators. Uh, I'm just a huge fan of them. For whatever reason, God has allowed me to be up close and personal on some pretty tragic scenes with first responders. And to see these men and women operate just blows my mind every time that I see them and, and, and operating in their world because you need to understand that these first responders, they do some unbelievable, very surreal things. Now, I'm sure what you do at your daily jobs, it's pretty awesome, all right? I'm not going to lie. But first responders, let's, let's be honest, they're running into danger when the rest of us are running away from it, right? They're running into fights or to fires. They're running to, to car wrecks. They're running to people that are drowning. They're running to the danger that everybody else is running away from. And, and to me, that's just an unbelievable thing. And so I'm just a huge fan of first responders. And, and it's also a, a very stark realization that my job is the exact opposite of first responders. Like, I can't relate at all. And I was thinking about that this week. Like, if I came home one day this week, came home, eating dinner, we're sitting down, I'm talking to Brianna, she's asking, how was your day? I was like, well, you know, it's fine, fine. Got up, studied for the sermon. Uh, returned some emails, sat in a meeting, fought a guy. And that was about it. <laughs> she would freak out. She goes, you what? I was like, you heard me. I returned some emails, sat in a meeting. She goes, no, you fought a guy? Oh, yeah, you know, I was driving. Uh, there was a drug deal going down. I politely asked them to stop, turn themselves in. They didn't, so I had to fight them. Well, no big deal. Right, you're, you're going, that's, but what's crazy is like first responders, like they're running into these things. They're running into fires. They're running into fights. They're running into people drowning. They're running to car wrecks and car scenes to, to help people out. And the fact that they do that, not just like on a once a year basis, but on a daily basis is and I'm just a huge fan for them. But then it makes me ask a question. It makes me ask a question, why? Why? Like, why do first responders do that? And the answer is not, they're, and they're not in it for the money. Like, if you ask the first responder, so are you getting rich doing this? They, they would laugh and go, oh, no. They, they're not in it for the money. They're not in it for the awards or plaques. I mean, there's way safer jobs that you can get all the awards and plaques and things that you want. So they're not in it for that. If you ask a first responder, they're in it. And if, if they're a Christian, they'll say they're called to it. If they're not a Christian, maybe they'll use the term, I'm wired for it. But they're designed, they're wired, they're calling everyone up to, to go help people, to rescue people, because there are people that need rescued. And so I'm just a huge fan of first response. So this whole idea of rescue is what we're talking about today. And you, you need to understand that first responders and, and myself, I, I, I love them to, to death and they give me a hard time because they know that, that my job is nothing like that, but just a huge appreciation for what they do. And, and I'll just give you, if you're a police officer, this is a freebie for you. So in church world, in church world, choir practice means something, means a choir practice. In police world, choir practice means something very, very different. And if you're a police officer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're not a police officer, you can go ask one. So they do something very, very different. But, but they rescue people, not for the money, not for the awards, not for the accolades, but because they're called, they're wired to do that. Now, there's a recipe for a rescue. There are three things that must happen in order for a rescue to take place. And, and you know this if you thought about it, but let me just put it into words for you. So a rescue, it needs three things. It needs a bad situation. It needs a person who, who needs help, and it needs for a rescuer to show up. A bad situation, someone who needs help, and a rescuer to show up. Now, if there's a bad situation and someone needs help, but that person saves themselves, it's not a rescue. It's a close call. It's, it's, it's in a, an escape. It was, a, it was something narrow, but they got out themselves. It must have a rescuer to show up in order for a rescue to take place. A bad situation, someone in help, Someone that needs help and then a rescuer to show up. Now, as you're sitting here today, you're thinking to yourself, you know, I get that, Chris, but at this moment in my life, Chris, I'm not needing a first responder. Like, as I'm sitting here today, Chris, you know, I'm not, you know, in a fire. 
I'm not in a car wreck. I'm not drowning. I'm not being threatened by a bad guy. You know, I'm, I'm not in a, in a dire mess. And so, Chris, I get that, but I'm not necessarily needing a first responder. And while that may be true, while you may be sitting here and, and not in a fire or in a car wreck or drowning or needing a first responder, may I pose a different theory, a different maybe set of circumstances you may need rescued from. You, you may be burning through your finances. Your relationships may be a wreck. You may be drowning in a sea of anxiety and worry. Your life may be threatened by anger or bitterness or resentment or, or, or being controlled by a substance or alcohol. And your life, as you sit there, may be on the outside, isn't, but on the inside, may be a mess. And so may I pose the idea that all of us need some sort of rescue. Bad situation, we're in the middle of it, and we need a rescuer to help. Now, if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, we're going to talk about this, and there's some Really great news. And for some of you, it's going to be a reminder. Some of you, it's going to be this aha moment. But it's a reminder, if you find yourself in a situation like that, a situation that's out of your control where you feel completely hopeless and helpless, there is some unbelievable news that there is someone there to rescue you. And if you're here and you're not a Christian or you're, you're a bit skeptical, then, then you honestly get to sit there and, and listen objectively and, and hear why we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, have hope and, and have joy, and then at the end, you get to, get to make a decision for yourself. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, and, and as I said, this text that we're about to study today, the timing of God is unbelievable in that we're walking through this text with, with everything going on in the world around us. Matthew chapter 14, it's a, it's a famous story. But it's a, it's a story of someone that was in a, a horrible situation that needed rescued and someone showed up. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22. It says, immediately after this, and after this was after Jesus fed the 5,000 people, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat, cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified in their fear, and they cried out, It's a ghost! Now, let me just stop right there. Let me just, let me just paint this picture. They're, they're there on the Sea of Galilee. They're, they're in a boat. You're going, what, what kind of boat is it? it? And back in 1986, a couple of guys, they discovered uh, a fishing boat there on the Sea of Galilee that would be a first century fishing boat. And so I brought a picture. And I want to show you this, this fishing boat. And that's what they discovered back in 1986. That, they don't know that that's what Jesus was in, but it was a boat found there on the shore. Now, if you look at that boat, that boat is 27 feet long and about seven and a half feet wide. Now, some of your pontoon boats are bigger than that one right there. All right, the disciples are in there. They're, they're on the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee was, was known for storms to, to rise up very, very quickly. Now, these guys in the boat, they're not rookies. They're not rookies. They, they aren't tourists. They don't have photo and cameras around there. They're not touring the Sea of Galilee. This is in their backyard. The, this is what these guys did for a living before they started following Jesus. A lot of them did. They, they were fishermen. This was not, nothing new to them. But something about this storm and this situation scared them to death. So we know it's not just, a, oh gosh, it's a little bit of a windstorm. It is something to make grown men, fishermen, commercial fishermen, scared to death. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, they're fighting the wind and the waves. And before you start going, well, why didn't they trust that it was Jesus? You put yourself in their shoes. Right? You're out on Lake Lanier at 3 o'clock in the morning, your little pontoon boat. Right? And all of a sudden, the storm is crazy and your, your motor's broken. And you're trying to paddle. All of a sudden, somebody comes walking across Lake Lanier to you. What are you going to think? You're going to go, oh, my. I mean, you're going to freak out. They go, it's a ghost. And so all of us would go, well, yeah, we'd probably think something like that. They cried out, it's a ghost. They're scared to death. And look at what Jesus says, and I love what he says. Look at verse 27. 
It says, but Jesus spoke to them at once. And you can almost hear it in his voice. He goes, don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. And I think it's fascinating that Jesus said, take courage. And then three little words, I am here. Not, I'm going to fix it. Not, I'm going to calm the storm. Not, I've got some life jackets for you. Just says, I am here. You take courage. You don't be afraid. And if you're in the middle of that proverbial life storm, financial storm, relational storm, a storm of anxiety, a a, a sea or of worry or fear, if that is you, take courage because Jesus is there. Take courage because Jesus is there. You're there in the middle of that storm. The, the proverbial seas all around you. Anxiety, fear, worry, anger, depression. You take courage because Jesus is there. Jesus would say to his disciples, he goes, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Later on in Hebrews, the Lord would say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Jesus just reminds them, I'm here. Didn't say I'm going to fix it. Didn't say I'm going to calm things down. Just speaks to them and says, it is I, the Lord. You take courage because I'm here in the middle of the storm with you. And some of you, you're there in the middle of the storm. You're fighting the proverbial ways of anxiety or fear or finances or your relationships are or, or, or a wreck. And you're there. And in the stillness of your heart and of your soul, my hope and my prayer is that you take comfort and courage knowing that the Lord is there with you. About four or five weeks ago, we were out at the lake with a bunch of people and one of the families had a boat and they were pulling people around in the tube and my two older boys, Daniel and David, 10 and 8, they wanted to go on the boat and so Brian's like, oh, you take them on the boat, I'll keep the younger two. So we're on the boat and uh, Daniel and his, his buddy, they get on the tube and the boat driver starts pulling them around, you know, sliding them around. They're having a blast and trying to get thrown off the tube and all that stuff. They drive it for 10, 15 minutes and they finish and David, my eight-year-old, he wants to do it. Well, David's a little guy and so I said, okay, all right, you boys get off. And so we, we put David on the tube and, uh, and they put him out there until the driver's like, hey, just kind of putt around. He just wants to, no, okay, no problem. Well, the boat driver starts putting around like five miles an hour. The only problem is, is David is maybe 50 pounds and kind of short. And so he doesn't have, you know, he's not pulling back on the tube. He's just like hanging on the tube. And at five miles an hour, like that tube nose catches. And in slow motion, it just starts diving into the water. And just to see the sheer terror on his face at five miles an hour. Like, it's just slow motion. He just kind of goes in there and, and tumbles in and bobs up with his life vest. And he goes, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. I was like, oh, okay. So I, we get him and lift him back in the boat. I go, you want to go in again? No, I don't want to go in. I don't want to go again. And I go, hey, what if, what if Daniel and his buddy, what if they ride with you? And all of a sudden, he goes, what do you mean? I go, well, that's big enough for three people. And they're like, yeah, we'll go with you. And so... All of a sudden, David gets in the middle, and then Daniel, his buddy, on either side, and now all of a sudden, the boat driver's going 15, 20 miles an hour. And what changed? It was still the same tube. It was still the same lake. In fact, the speed went from 5 miles an hour to 15 or 20 miles an hour. The only thing that changed in David's mind was the people that were with him. And when you understand that you may be walking through the storm and the, the, the seas of life may not be calming around you, but when you understand that Jesus is there with you, you take courage and you look at fear and you go, not today. And you look at discouragement and you go, not today. And you look at worry or anxiety and everything, you go, not today. And all of a sudden you go, why? Because Jesus is with me. And so I take courage and know the seas may not calm down and know the storm may not cease, but Jesus is with me. And so I will not be afraid. I will begin to walk through these storms with courage and not fear. And then the story takes a very interesting, almost humorous twist. Look at verse 28. It says, then Peter called to him. Lord, if it's really you, <clears throat> tell me to come to you walking on the water. Now, only the disciple Peter would have, like, the courage to do that. There's a storm. It's a ghost. It's I, the Lord. Because, well, Lord, if it's you, you know, can I come on out there? And the Lord says, yes, come, Jesus said. And I'm sure Peter was going, oh, man. What's my wife going to say now? I, mean, I don't know what, you know. Yes, come. So Peter, verse 29, went over the side of the boat, 
walked on the water toward Jesus. Now, if you study this before, but I just put myself in Peter's shoes. If I'm doing that, I'm going, oh, my goodness. Like, nobody's going to believe this. Like, there's Jesus, and all of a sudden, he's walking on water. And then all of a sudden, something happens. Verse 30 says, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Now, this is my own opinion, so you can take it for what it's worth. I don't think those were the first words he shouted. <laughs> I think he yelled something in Matthew's going, I can't put that in the Bible. So uh, what do you say next? Save me, Lord. That'll do. And puts that in there. I, I, <laughs> I, I, that's my own, own opinion. I've just been around men who's been scared and they yell other things. So save me, Lord, he shouted. Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. I want you to write this down in your notes. If you find yourself in the middle of a storm, have humility enough to seek help. Have humility, enough humility to seek help. Now, we preachers, we love to preach this passage on getting out of the boat. I've preached it before. Get out of the boat. Have enough faith to get out of the boat. Get out of the boat. Take that sip of faith. When everyone else is saying no, have enough faith to get out of the boat. Quick question. What happens when you get out of the boat and you begin to sink? Like, what happens when everyone goes, you're too young to get married. Oh, by faith, I'm getting married. Oh, my goodness, marriage is difficult. You, don't, you need to wait to have kids. Oh, they don't know. I want to have some kids. And so you have kids. Wow, kids are a lot of work and expensive. Don't start that job. Don't start your business. Wait a few more years to get more experience. Ah, oh, what do you know? I'm stepping out of the boat. I'm starting the business. Oh, my goodness, I'm losing my shirt. See, we, we love to say, get out of the boat. It's fun. It's, it's inspirational. Well, they were told not to do it, and they got out of the boat, and it worked. Oh, they told the others to get out of the boat. But what happens when you get out of the boat, and it doesn't work? What happens when you begin to sink? What happens when you're getting all flat on your back? Yes, have enough faith to get out of the boat when, when maybe no one else is, but also have enough humility to ask for help if it's not going well. It's interesting. When Peter begins to sink, he, he shouts, save me, Lord. Now, I think it's interesting that he doesn't go back to the boat and ask the guys for a life vest. When he's sinking, he doesn't go, hey, guys, throw me a rope. When he's sinking, he doesn't say, well, you know, he doesn't begin to swim back. He reaches out to Jesus and says, save me, Lord. And I think all too often we allow embarrassment or pride or ego or fatigue or just sheer stubbornness to keep us from reaching out to the helping hand. For many of us, we're, we're in this sea and we're drowning and there's a hand reaching out. And we've got our arms crossed going, I'll figure it out myself. I took this step of faith. I'll swim back to the boat. I'll do something. But I am not reaching out to that hand for help. And a helping hand comes in so many different shapes and forms. Maybe it's just in the encouraging word of a friend. Or, or maybe it's a listening ear, or, or maybe it's a different job opportunity, and maybe it's not the job opportunity that you wanted, but it, but it is a different opportunity. There are people out there that are willing to help. Maybe it's a 12-step program. Maybe it's sitting down with a counselor that says, man, I'm here to help you, and you've got your arms crossed and going, I'll figure it out myself. I'll swim back to the boat myself. I'll ask my friends to throw me a life vest rather than reaching out to the hand of the Savior. Yes, have enough faith to get out of the boat, but also have enough humility to seek help when you need it. I played one year of tackle football. I played in fifth grade. And at the end of that year, my agent said, it's time to retire and pursue a career in preaching. So <laughs> I was short, small, and slow, which is not a good recipe, you know, for a professional football player. So I saw the writing on the wall. I was like, you know what? After fifth grade, it's good. But fifth grade, I played one year tackle football. I played flag football up until that point. Wouldn't play tackle football. I was like, okay. Played for the YMCA there in San Antonio. Now, you need to understand that growing up, we didn't have a whole lot of money, like, at all. At all. We could barely afford that. And so signed up. But as you know, like, helmets and pads, they're really expensive. I mean, we didn't have enough money to do that. So, and I talked to my dad about this yesterday. So if you're watching, Dad, I'm sharing this about you. So uh, instead of going to Academy or someplace to buy it, he calls up the director of the YMCA, who he knew, and goes, hey, do you have any used gear that we could borrow? 
And I guess he knew that I wasn't going to be like a lifelong football player, so he wanted to borrow it. So the guy goes, yes. Yeah. So I just remember going to this mini storage there at the YMCA. He rolls it up. And there's like all this football gear. It looked like from the 1950s, okay? I was like, is that a leather helmet? He's like, no, you're fine. So like he slapped this helmet and these shoulder pads on, and this helmet looked like out of PVC plastic. And by the grace of God, my mom goes, hey, we should probably buy him like a nice air helmet. So they bought me a good air, air helmet, but I had the, like the thin little shoulder pla- pads and pants. Do you remember that movie, The Little Giants? That was me, all right, just kind of this use. And so I show up, and I don't remember much about that year except for this one play. In this one play, I remember because I'd become best buddies with a guy named Seth. Now, Seth was a stud. He went on to play high school football, and he was just fast and big. And, and I played cornerback, and he played safety. And I only remember this one play in fifth grade. I remember they, they, they call it, they said hike. It was an end around sweep. They tossed it to the guy. He's running around. I'm the cornerback. It's coming to my side. So I'm there like this little guy, and they teach you to form tackle, which is great, like if you've got some girth on you. And I just remember, okay, form talk, you know, heads up, you got to keep your heads up. And he's coming right at me. And I just remember going like this. And the next thing I know, I'm just flat on my back. Like I'm going, something didn't happen and all of that. And, and I look just to, I'm going, man, this guy's about to score. And in that brief moment, my buddy Seth, who's the safety, comes over and tackles him out of bounds. And I'm there, and it's one of those where you, they hit and all the parents go, ooh type of deal. It was one of those going, ooh, whose kid is that? You know, and, and I'm there, and you just kind of want to make sure everything moves. And all I remember is that Seth comes over, big guy, and goes, you all right, man? And he had his hand out, and I just go, yeah. And I just get up kind of dizzy and go on to the next play. And, and I tell you that because some of you, you're prepared for the storm. You're ready to go. You think, I've got this. And the next thing you know, you're flat on your back. Finances, relationships, loss of jobs, sickness, you're there. Somebody's got a handout going, are you okay? And you've got your arms crossed and go, I'll get up myself. I'll figure it out myself. Because I'm embarrassed. I've got pride. I've got ego. I'm just tired. Have enough humility to seek help. And then look how the story finishes up. It says, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. And here's what Jesus said. Verse 31, he goes, you have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And if you find yourself in the middle of the storm, Trust that Jesus will rescue, don't miss this, even if the storm doesn't stop. Trust that Jesus will rescue, will show up, will provide, even if the storm doesn't stop. Don't miss this. The storm didn't stop when Jesus reached out. The storm didn't stop when Jesus saved them. In fact, they had to walk back together through the storm. The storm did not stop until they got back into the boat. At any point in this story, Jesus could have calmed the storms. Walking on water, he could have said, all right, that's enough. And the wind and the waves would have calmed down. When they saw him, he'd have gone, hey, fellas, I'm just going to get in the boat, calm the storm down. But he allows the story to unfold. He allows the disciples to experience the storm. He allows Peter to begin to walk through the storm. He allows Peter to sing. He saves Peter, and together they walk back through the storm. And not until they got back into the boat did the storm stop. But Jesus still saved Peter, even though the storm continued to rage on. If you find yourself in the middle of that proverbial storm of life, you trust that Jesus will rescue, even if that storm doesn't stop. It's interesting, you know, Jesus said, why why did you doubt me? And what's interesting is literally hours before this happened, like earlier that day, this is three o'clock in the morning, earlier that day, Peter had been an eyewitness of Jesus taking a little boy's happy meal and feeding 5,000 plus people. I mean, it was literally hours before. I mean, you can just imagine. Look, you would freak out if I showed up here with like a Chick-fil-A meal and go, hey, I'm going to feed everybody in here. First of all, the fact that I showed up with Chick-fil-A on a Sunday, that's the miracle in and of itself. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> not, maybe not Chick-fil-A, but whatever. But you know what I'm talking about. You'd freak out. You're going, oh, my goodness. Right, and, and Peter had just witnessed that. Like this little boy, hey, got some 
some fish and some bread, you know, and they're like, what are, you, what are we going to do? And Jesus is like, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take care of it. And Jesus begins to feed 5,000 plus people there. He had just witnessed that hours earlier and still he doubted. And I say that because I think oftentimes in life, I know personally, I've seen God do some unbelievable things in my life. Yet somehow in my next storm, in my next struggle, I wonder if he's going to show up. Like, I, I've seen God just going, oh, my goodness. He delivered. He answered. I'm so glad that didn't happen. I'm so glad this did happen. See, all these things, but I'm not sure this is going to work out. I'm not sure God knows exactly, you know, my situation and how it's all going to work out. And we, we begin to doubt even though we've seen him do some unbelievable things. I'm just curious. How many of you growing up, you, you played with the little toy, the jack-in-the-box, just by a show of hands. You know what I'm talking about? Where you do, 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 do. Okay, good. I, I, you know, I had those growing up, and they haven't changed, you know, so you just kind of turn the thing. And I don't know about you, but personally, every single time I was shocked when it popped up. <laughs> Heard you? You go, dun, 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 dun. And you're going, oh, they want a point, and it scares you to death, right? Oh, and you push it back down. It's the craziest toy. The guy probably made millions of dollars. But, but every time you're going, it's, it's not going to happen, right? And you keep waiting, and you keep waiting, and all of a sudden, it happens, and I think oftentimes we treat God like that, going, well, it's not going to happen. Well, if it, was just, it didn't happen in my timing or it didn't work out the way, and we're going, is he still going to show up? Is he still going to rescue me? God, do you know the broken heart that I've experienced? God, do you know the job loss? God, have you seen my bank account? God, my, my prodigal son or daughter that I've been praying for, God, do you know that they're still out there running on their own and doing their own thing? God, do you still know? Will you still show up? find yourself in a bad situation, you need help, you need rescue, you trust that Jesus will rescue even if the storm doesn't stop. <coughs> and so you're sitting here today, no, you, you may not at this moment be trapped in the middle of a fire or you may not be drowning or you may not be in a car wreck or you, you may not be threatened by a bad guy, but we're all in need of a rescue. We all have things that are overwhelming. We all find ourselves in situations where we're going, if God doesn't show up, I think I'm going to drown. If God doesn't show up, if he doesn't reach his hand out, I think I'm going to sink right here in the middle of this storm. You take courage that Jesus is there with you. You have enough humility to reach out to that helping hand when it's extended out there toward you. And you trust that Jesus will rescue even if the storm doesn't Stop. Now, here's the cool thing. A recipe for a rescue. Bad situation. There's someone in need of help, and a rescuer shows up. We know that. That in and of itself is a picture of the gospel or the good news of Jesus. There's a bad situation. The world is an evil, evil place. There's somebody in need of help. Us, we're in the middle of that, and a rescuer shows up. His name is Jesus. Bad world, bad place that, that we all find ourselves in. We're all in need of a Savior, and a rescuer shows up, and his name is Jesus, and it is the greatest rescue the world has ever known. And the question is, will you accept his hand for help, or will you cross your arms and go, I'll figure it out myself? You know, the good news for Christians is that we have placed our faith and our trust in Jesus. And we know that the greatest rescue, that regardless of what happens here on this earth, is that the greatest rescue happens when we go from this earth to heaven. But that only happens when we accept the hand of a rescuer, Jesus. I'll finish with this. And it's Galatians chapter 1, and it's Paul. He really writes about this whole idea of being rescued. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, May God our Father... And the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. That is the good news of Jesus. An evil world, bad situation. Somebody needs help. We are all here in the middle of this earth, separated from a holy God because of what we've done. 
And a rescuer enters. His name was Jesus. 2,000 years ago, goes to the cross, pays for our, our sins, and, so, and simply says, if you would place your faith in Jesus, what he did on the cross, and the fact that God did raise him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be rescued. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, my guess is you still find yourself in a very scary situation in life, a very hopeless situation in life. And you're drowning in a sea of anxiety or you're burning for your finances, your, your relationships are a wreck. You're sinking down in this proverbial storm of life. You're going, I need help. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus is there to rescue if you call upon him as Lord. Let me pray for us. With every head bowed and every eye closed. For those of you who are Christians, you know that there is good news in Jesus and that there is a, a rescuer there. And for maybe far too long, you've tried to do things on your own. But maybe today you just say, you know what, I, I'm reminded that Jesus is my rescuer and my hope and I place my faith in him and I trust that he will see me through this because I've seen him do it in the years past. But for those of you here in this room that you're not a Christian, you're not a Jesus follower, I'm just a simple preacher here in North Georgia, but I'm just going to tell you as, as your friend and someone who cares for you, you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You need a rescue. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're ready to trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross, and they're going, you know what, Chris, I walk in this room very hopeless, very helpless, and I want to walk out of this room hope-filled. You call upon Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You make him king of your life, and you walk out of this room a new person. If you're ready to do that, just say something like this quietly to yourself. Just say, Lord Jesus, today I trust you. I ask your forgiveness for all my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word. And help me to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for my salvation. Father, I pray for everybody here in this room. So easy to put the happy church face on, but those that need rescue, Lord, my prayer is that they place their trust and their hope in you and they take courage because you are there with them. Father, together we lift up all of those affected by Irma, affected by Harvey, as they're traveling around. God, we pray for the, the, the churches and the communities and the people there, God, that you'd go before them. And Lord, that they would turn their eyes and their hearts to you in this situation, in this storm. Jesus, we love you and ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen.